All right, so we're, we're going to get started with the second panel. I, we've got a hard act to follow after uh, our trailblazers that want to send everything back to Congress before it becomes a final rule. Uh, this panel is going to look more broadly at uh, uh, reforms that Congress can do to uh, play a, a more prominent role in the modern administrative state. Uh, and this is an exciting time to talk about this. Uh, the former minority party in, in Congress, in the Senate, has had eight years to come up with all types of fun uh, regulatory reform proposals. And now there's unified government with those same proposals floating around. And there may be some appetite to actually do something. So, so we, we've got some exciting time here in Congress uh, to think about that. And, I, and, and we've got a great panel uh, assembled here to talk uh, about these potential reforms and some of the bigger picture issues uh, of how Congress can play a role uh, in the administrative state. And so I'm just going to do really, really brief introductions. Uh, and we're going to go our, our five minute remarks and go in the order that we're going down. And I'll start first uh, to my immediate left is Susan Dudley, who's the director of the George Washington University Regulatory Studies Center. Uh, if you are not subscribed to the weekly Reg Digest that the center puts out, you should be. Uh, it's amazing. They collect all everything that's going on across the internets uh, on the administrative state and puts it a nice, in a nice digest. And you can follow them on Twitter as well. She's the president of the Society of the Benefit, uh, Benefit Cost Analysis. She's a senior fellow at the Administrative Conference of the United States. And I think importantly, unlike the rest of us on the panel, she's not a lawyer. She's an economist. Uh, she was the administrator of the Office of Immigration, uh, Immigration Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, OIRA. Um, uh, and so we're happy to have her here uh, to provide that perspective that's going to be a little bit unique from the, lawyer, the rest of the lawyers on the panel. Uh, the next person we have on the panel is Dick Pierce. It's about all the introduction that he needs. Uh, he's a Lyle T. Alverson Professor of Law at George Washington uh, University Law School. Uh, he and Kristen and other panelists are the co-authors of the Administrative Law Treatise. Uh, he's a foundational figure uh, in the administrative law field. Uh, then we have a less foundational figure, uh, Adam White, <laughs> who's a rising star troublemaker of administrative law, a research fellow at the Hoover Institution. He's been writing a lot of really great stuff uh, at the, the Weekly Standard. Uh, and other places about the Gorsuch nomination that I've really enjoyed reading, among other things. Uh, and he's also been causing some trouble with a report that I'm sure he's going to plug in a minute uh, about how to re how comprehensive re reform of the administrative state. And last but definitely not least, we have Kristen Hickman, who's the distinguished McKnight University professor and Harlan Albert Rogers professor of law at the University of Minnesota Law School. Uh, she is the leading uh, scholar on the intersection of tax and administrative law, uh, but she also does a lot of really important work on judicial review of agency actions as well. And so we're happy to have this panel. As I said, we're going to do five minutes. I'm going to keep the clock because there were a lot of questions uh, after the first panel, and I think there'll be more here. Uh, and so we're going to start with Susan and then, then go down the line. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, and thank you also to Naomi and the ABA ad law section because I certainly enjoyed this morning's panel and, and I'm looking forward to this one. So my job was just to give you an overview and it's going to be a little bit similar to what you heard um, this morning about the concerns that people have about lack of accountability in Congress. And, um, and I'm probably going to offend all my legislative staff friends here, so Matt is sitting in front and I apologize in advance. Um, Congress tends, they pass legislation when it comes authorizing regulation that allows them to take credit for broad public goals like um, clean air or affordable care. Um, and then they delegate, as we heard this morning, they delegate the details to the agencies to, to fill out the details. Um, without recognizing that there are costs associated with achieving those goals. Um, and then when their constituents object to the actual effects of the regulations, they can use their soapbox to, abl to blame the executive branch agencies for, in, you know, you hear about executive branch overreach. So from Congress's perspective, it's really kind of a win-win because you get two hits at that, at that apple. Um, and I just want to contrast it a little bit with spending programs where, um, which is another key tool for achieving policy objectives. 
they, they not only have to be authorized with the broad goal of the program, but they also have to be appropriated. So there's a recognition that we have these big goals, but we also are, we, there are limitations in how we achieve them. Um, and in contrast, regulations are authorized off-budget spending without the accountability that comes with that um, appropriations process. Um, so there are several legislative attempts to make Congress more accountable to voters for regulatory outcomes, both good and bad outcomes of regulations. We heard this morning about, um, earlier, about the RAINS Act and the Congressional Review Act. Um, another one, and Chris just wanted us to talk briefly about some of the other ones. Um, the Regulatory Accountability Act um, would, uh, would amend the Administrative Procedure Act. and. In include additional procedures, but also requirements for analysis, similar to the requirements that executive branch agencies have had in place, as I think John, Jonathan Adler mentioned, for the last 30 years or more. Um, I do think there is value in codifying Executive Order 12866 12 um, that President Clinton issued. Um, and I would actually encourage Congress to hew as closely as possible to the language in that executive order in codifying it. Um, there's also interest in retrospective review of regulations. And again, if you contrast regulations and spending programs, spending programs, there's a whole field of evaluation where agencies have large evaluation programs, offices, where they look to see what are the actual results? Are we achieving what we thought we would be achieving? In regulation, we just don't see that at all, despite the fact that each of the la every president since Carter has required agencies to look at the effects of existing regulations as well as new regulations. And in fact, President Obama issued three or four executive orders targeted at that, but it still doesn't, it, it's not happening. Um, so there's, um, I guess, the Scrub Act just passed the House yesterday um, that would form a commission that would do that. I know in the Senate last year, um, Heitkamp and Langford had a bill that they called the prospective retrospective review that they would require agencies to plan for how they would evaluate their rules up front. Um, and I also think that um, President Trump's executive order on two for one, to, that for every regulation two must be removed or you need to offset the cost of new regulations, that has potential to, to provide the incentives that have been lacking to look to see what the effect of existing regulations are. Um, but then I, um, in my last couple minutes, let me just um, say that what I would like Congress generally when issuing new statutes to recognize that there are costs as well as, um, that there are costs as well as benefits, and explicitly allow the president um, to recognize the need to constrain regulatory costs when implementing statutory language. And that could be something as simple as language in the next budget bill. Um, this is something suggested by Brian Mannix in a recent Law and Liberty blog that just says, acknowledges that the chief executive um, has authority to set priorities and to constrain re regulatory costs within the framework established by, by statutes. Um, and also I would like Congress when enacting new statutes that authorize legislation and this is certainly agreeing with Jonathan Adler who said that they do that very rarely and so we, ought, we really are dealing with statutes that are 20 and 30 years old but when, when doing so respect the, the value of competition and choice and market forces um, allow for experimentation and learning um, but also require analysis of impacts Requ don't preclude agencies from setting priorities and looking at the benefits and the costs. Um, so that's my opening. Great. Uh, Dick? So I, I think yeah. that uh, the regulatory reform that, uh, oh, thanks, Susan. <laughs> the, booming voice, the regulatory reform efforts uh, uh, that should be undertaken now should build on the outstanding foundation that President Reagan provided in Executive Order 12291. Just to remind you of what that did, uh, it uh, first required every agency, every executive branch agency to uh, uh, engage in cost-benefit analysis and then uh, told them that it, they had to issue uh, 
rules, they could only issue rules where the benefits exceeded the costs, and they had to choose the alternative that would create uh, the largest difference between the benefits and the costs, and then finally that they had to uh, review existing rules and rescind those where the costs exceeded the benefits. And, and I'd point out that this has been extraordinarily effective, and just to illustrate it, uh, 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 this, this, this was being, to be implemented by the Office of Information and Regulatory Analysis within OMB, the office that Susan uh, uh, headed for, for a number of years. And they were given the, the responsibility and the power to implement it and make sure agencies were complying with it. To show how effective this was, the latest, the, the OIRA report for the period 2003 to 2013, that 10-year period, uh, found that the benefits, the average benefits that were created by a rule was, were seven to eight times greater than the costs that the rule imposed. So this has been an extraordinarily successful venture. I would uh, urge uh, some combination of Congress and OMB, it really needs to be a joint effort to, to be effective, to extend and build on that platform in three ways. First, uh, to apply it to independent agencies as well as to executive branch agencies. I see no justification whatsoever for saying that an agency like the Securities and Exchange Commission, because it's headed by five people instead of one person, uh, is exempt from this and is free to issue rules that uh, impose costs that exceed their benefits. There's been several studies that have found that the agencies that are subject to Executive Order 12291 and the OIRA review process simply engage in higher quality analysis and higher quality reasoning when they make decisions. So it would be, I think, an, an enormously beneficial step to extend the uh, 12291 regulatory reform regime to independent agencies as well as to executive branch agencies. The second thing I would do is uh, 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 to invite every regulated firm to identify any rule that the firm believes to be obsolete or unduly uh, 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 burdensome and to send a submission to OIRA in which the firm makes the case and says, okay, here's why we believe this rule is either obsolete or unduly uh, uh, burdensome. And then document it. And then OIRA should have the power to direct the agency that's responsible for that rule, if OIRA agrees with the analysis, uh, to rescind the rule or amend the rule so that it is not unduly burdensome and not obsolete. Uh, now, there's a kind of a version of this that uh, uh, the new OMB head, uh, uh, former Congressman Mulvaney, put out in his guidance uh, to implement the, the one out, two in rule, where he said, well, agencies have the power, should have the freedom to identify rules issued by other agencies that would, um, uh, they, that one agency thinks the other agency has issued a rule that uh, is obsolete or unduly. Well, frankly, that's not going to have any damn effect at all. The, 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 each agency doesn't know anything about the other agency's rules, and they certainly don't have any incentive. They have neither the expertise, the knowledge, or the incentive to engage in that. The regulated firms certainly do. The big payoff for them is if they're right, and they convince OIRA that they're right, then they're relieved of whatever this uh, undue burden is. So, and, and they have the information and the expertise necessary to make that case persuasively to OIRA. And then the third step I would urge is a massive increase in the, the funding and, and appropriations for o o OIRA. OIRA has been understaffed and underfunded uh, for years. It has not had the capability to perform effectively its existing functions. It certainly wouldn't have the, the capability to perform the additional functions that I would urge that it uh, uh, be given uh, the responsibility to, to uh, implement. Uh, they need more people. They need more funding. 
to uh, be effective. Uh, I, I, I see Susan nodding. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I also uh, I provided a little handout uh, that, that gives you a summary of my reasons for thinking that most of the other regulatory reform bills that are under consideration today are ill-conceived and based on a, a serious misunderstanding of some combination of the reality of government regulation by agencies and the reality of the congressional process. I, I would just urge one uh, article to your attention, an old, old article by a fellow named Jack Beetson uh, who, who teaches at uh, Cambridge University and uh, sometimes uh, uh, drifts across the pond and studies us and uh, teaches here as well. Jack did a study of the, the parliamentary committee who was assigned the task of implementing something like the RAINS Act. And it, 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 he concluded that it was considered Siberia. That's where you send, because they, they never got any attention at all. Nobody paid, and, and certainly the history, the sad history of the Congressional Review Act bears that out. I, I, it, there is not nearly the time uh, in, in the House and Senate to do all of the things effectively that the RAINS Act uh, uh, expects the Congress to do. So I'll pass the mic to Adam. Thank you. So yesterday was Ash Wednesday. Uh, I'm Catholic, so I filed into church with the others and listened to my priest telling me that we live in a fallen world, we need to atone, and, and as he's smudging ashes on my forehead, and I'm thinking about what a fallen world we live in, my thoughts naturally started to drift to the administrative state. Um, <laughs> but the jokes aside, I mean, I, I do intend a serious point in there, that administrative law, it's, it's, it's not perfect, just as our government's not perfect. Administrative law is a place where I think we need to strike pragmatic compromises, right? We take, we take the government as it is. We know we need both Congress to have a word in this, Congress needs to delegate powers uh, to these agencies so that they can administer government, right? And so the task for administrative law and administrative reform isn't utopian. It's trying to strike balances and create incentives uh, that get us the best situation, the best outcomes we can. Maybe they're second best, but maybe that's the best we can get. Um, I still think Justice Scalia's famous article in 1989, his Duke Law Review article, is, is maybe the best statement on the principles that should guide administrative law and administrative reform. This idea that administrative law is a place where, there's, where the Constitution leaves at least a little room for playing the joints. And it's a question about how we strike the right balance and create the right incentives. You know, I, I'm not referring to anybody on this panel, but outside of this, this panel, I do get a sense sometimes in the debates over administrative law and administrative reform that um, there's, there's too many utopians in this, too many people who see the Administrative Procedure Act of 1946, of 1946, as written in stone, right? The APA wasn't carried down from Mount, Mount Sinai by Jackson and Frankfurter, James Landis. It was passed by Congress, which, no offense to the people here in the room, is not exactly uh, heaven on earth, right? But Congress, in 1946, looked at the administrative state as it actually existed at the time, based on decades of debate and analysis inside of government and outside of government to grapple with the reality of the administrative state as it existed at the time, and they tried to map some laws onto it to nudge it in the right direction. And so I think the challenge for Congress today is to do that again, to stop treating the APA as sacrosanct, stop listening to law professors who think you can't change any of this, and to try to make pragmatic adjustments that reflect the administrative state as it exists today. Um, when you do that, I don't think you're, 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 when you do that, I think you're, you're acting in the spirit of the Congress that passed the APA in 1946. I think administrative law should reflect the administrative reality. And so that's why I'm a fan of, of much, most of what's in the Regulatory Accountability Act. Um, I'm not trying to sell it short. I mean, it changes from Congress to Congress, but, but the vast bulk of what's in there I like, especially the heightened procedural requirements for agency rulemakings for the costliest, most burdensome of rules. I think it's insane that today the Clean Power Plan, the Open Internet, 
uh, the open internet order, net neutrality, the waters of the United States rule, these things are promulgated through something we call informal rulemaking. All right? Just, I mean, not to be semantic, but those laws shouldn't be passed through anything that's informal. It should be the most formal of rulemakings. This should be put on your tuxedo rulemaking. Um, you know, I see Aaron Nielsen in the audience. What he's written on this, I think, is very strong. But the problem is, when you propose formal rulemaking for these rules, the response is always that agencies will then evade rulemaking. They'll either act through adjudications, guidance documents, they'll do other things to avoid the process. And that's a fair point, because again, this is a question about incentives. And so here's one practical proposal I would offer to those of you who are thinking about it right now on, the, on Capitol Hill, is as you impose new procedural requirements on agencies, try to create the incentives to get them to go through those hoops. One example I think is Chevron deference. Right now, at the same time that we're having a debate over procedural requirements, the RAA, we're having a separate debate over Chevron deference, Separation of Powers Restoration Act. Let's abolish Chevron deference. I mean, I'll be honest, I'm kind of agnostic on Chevron deference. It's, it's had some real problems recently, but compared to what came before it, I'm not sure that it's that much worse. Um, but I think instead of thinking of Chevron as an all or nothing debate, I think you should use Chevron deference as a pragmatic tool to get them to jump through the hoops. Um, this is my last point. That if you want agencies to go through rulemaking, then take away Chevron deference for everything other than rulemaking. Take away our deference for everything other than uh, for rulemaking, right? Don't outlaw Chevron altogether. Just say that if the agencies want it, they got to go through a rulemaking process. Then the agencies are faced with a choice at the beginning of the process. Either they do it the easy way, through guidance documents or adjudication, um, and then they know at the end of the process they're going to get scrutinized more thoroughly by the courts. But if they want to open up the process at the front end and bring in more transparency, more interaction with the public, more accountability through formal rulemaking or through rulemaking where the agency wouldn't otherwise do it, then they pay that price up front. And, I'll be, and if you look back at the legislative debates giving rise to the, the 46 Act, um, and it's written right there in the rulemaking exceptions, Congress thought about this in, the, in, in these terms back then. The whole reason why they exempted policy statements, interpretive rules, and those other things is they wanted to not impede the creation of those lesser important documents. They wanted to incentivize them. Think about it in the same way. I thought Matt Owen's point in the previous panel was exactly right. As much as I do like the RAINS Act, He's thinking through to the next level, and he's thinking, what incentives does that create? And I'd urge everybody who's making policy on it to think about it in those terms. Thank you. OK, so as the last speaker on this panel, um, what I want to talk about today is the need to think a little bit more about justiciability, that is, the availability of judicial review at the outset. Lots of agency actions don't ever see the inside of a courtroom. Um, but the original Administrative Procedure Act very clearly set up judicial review as a mechanism for ensuring that agencies followed the procedural and process requirements that in turn generated transparency and accountability. Um, so thinking about judicial review, I think it often is something of an afterthought, you know, thinking about justiciability and how cases are going to get to court in the first place. Um, and I think it's something that we ought to think about a little bit more. Um, so, you know, when you think about it, the, the current Administrative Procedure Act of, you know, you go through notice and comment rulemaking, and then we have this norm since Abbott Labs in the late 1960s, we've got this norm of pre-enforcement judicial review of regulations. It doesn't work perfectly. But the EPA knows when it promulgates a regulation that it's going to pretty soon, as soon as it gets it promulgated, it's going to have to go defend it in court. Um, it's not a perfect system, but I think it works pretty well, at least, for that sort of check and balance, making sure that uh, agencies are at least following the procedures and processes we want them to follow in order to ensure transparency and accountability. Um, but agencies have gotten pretty creative about avoiding the procedural and process requirements that ensure that transparency and accountability and lead to meaningful judicial review. We've got an overuse of guidance documents, which has been talked about a little bit already today. But beyond, even beyond that, we've got settlement agreements through coordinated litigation, for example. Uh, we've got compliance waivers. These are just a few examples of the ways in which agencies act in meaningful, meaningful ways that impact
primary behavior without having to go through the procedural requirements of the APA and without uh, allowing people to, make, to obtain meaningful judicial review. Um, now, uh, these are just, like I say, a few examples. Uh, because we're in front of a largely legislative branch audience, I think, I want to focus on a particular example of avoidance of judicial review uh, that I think is particularly and relatively easily <laughs> correctable through legislation, uh, and that it happens to be in my own particular wheelhouse of tax and administrative law. Um, in recent decades, it's become very fashionable to embed social welfare and regulatory programs in the Internal Revenue Code. Anytime there's a problem out there, let's have a tax credit, let's have a tax deduction. Um, the Affordable Care Act is interwoven with the Internal Revenue Code, but it's not the first such act. We've got ERISA. The IRS these days, our revenue collection agency, is one of the largest anti-poverty agencies that we have. Um, you know, and and. No matter the problem, the solution seems to be, let's run it through the tax code. And that's fine, and there are good reasons for doing that, um, that we can talk about another day. But there's one really key drawback, and that has to do with justiciability and the access to judicial review for parties uh, when the IRS and Treasury promulgate regulations or guidance documents implementing all of these provisions. The Anti-Injunction Act. Section 7421A of the Internal Revenue Code precludes judicial review of cases that restrain the assessment and collection of taxes. Um, and the courts, uh, the, the, the jurisprudence interpreting this provision is kind of a mess. It dates back to 1867 in the original Civil War income tax, so we've had a long time to screw up the judicial interpretation of the Anti-Injunction Act. But for example, taxes not only includes what you would think of as taxes. It also includes a variety of penalties that are labeled as additions to tax. Uh, but more importantly even um, is the way that the courts recently have started interpreting it. The DC Circuit in particular has ter interpreted the Anti-Injunction Act to cut off judi pre-enforcement judicial review of Treasury and IRS regulations and rulings. Um, so historically, this provision was intended to protect the integrity of IRS enforcement efforts against recalcitrant taxpayers. In the Florida bankers case about a year and a half ago, I think now, the D.C. Circuit interpreted the Anti-Injunction Act really, really broadly with sweeping rhetoric in a way that when you look at the practical implications, means that we won't have pre-enforcement review of Treasury regulations or IRS guidance documents. Um, historically, that might not have been quite so problematic because taxpayers could raise those challenges later in statutory refund and deficiency actions. You know, the old pay your taxes and sue for a refund, or we've got the tax court that if you underpay your taxes and the IRS assesses you, you can then go to tax court and get judicial review without paying the taxes. But with the embedding of social welfare and regulatory programs in the tax system, about a third these days, I did an empirical study on this, about a third of Treasury regulations these days aren't related to traditional revenue raising. They don't necessarily lead to you filing a tax return and paying your taxes and being able to sue for a refund or having the IRS saying you underpaid your taxes so you can go to tax court. Um, they don't actually lead to traditional Me mechanisms of getting to judicial review for tax cases. The result ends up being that in practical terms, they're not reviewable at all. I don't think when Congress put these provisions into the Internal Revenue Code that they were thinking about justiciability in the Anti-Injunction Act and contemplating that regulations determining eligibility for government benefits or imposing paperwork requirements on uh, regulated parties, third-party reporting requirements, or for that matter, defining essential health benefits under the Affordable Care Act, these sorts of things. I don't think Congress intended to shield them from pre-enforcement judicial review. But I think it was sort of a, a not thinking about justiciability, not thinking about those checks and balances that are inherent in the administrative state and failing to recognize that particular consequence. Again, this is just one example. There are many throughout the administrative state, many ways that we're able, agencies are able to avoid judicial review. Um, I just think it's something that as, whether you're talking about adding a new tax credit to the tax code, or in any 
particular piece of legislation, thinking about the interaction of that legislation with the APA's mechanisms for seeking pre-enforcement review is, and, and obtaining that judicial check against agency action, I think that's something that ought to get more consideration than it does. Great. So we've got a lot of different ideas out there on this panel. And, 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 and I, I, maybe I want to take a pause here and kind of focus this around the, the House bill that just passed in, in January that's deceptively called the Regulatory Accountability Act, but it's a lot more than the Portman you know, Act that we're talking about. So we've got a suite of six uh, different pieces of legislation that have been introduced in the prior Congress. You've got the Portman Regulatory Accountability Act. Uh, you've got the Separation of Powers Restoration Act, which is the Hatch Act to get rid of uh, Chevron and our deference. You've got the Small Business, uh, what's the title? Regulatory Flexibility Improvement Act, which says agencies think about cost to small businesses. You've got the Review Act uh, that allows for judicial review to be completed before billion dollar rules uh, take effect. Uh, you've got the Alert Act that says put everything online, agencies, let us know what's going on. And lastly, you have the Providing Accountability, Accountability Through Transparency Act, which I think is plain language, plain English language requirements that agencies actually tell the public what the rules actually do, what, that they're proposing instead of just posting the, the long uh, notice uh, uh, on their website in the Federal Register. So you've got a lot going on there. Uh, and, and it you know, passed the House in January. They'll be interested to see what the Senate does. But I kind of want to kind of frame some of our, our discussion about this, and also I'm guessing some of the questions of the audience will go around this as well. But I do want to return to kind of the, the Portman uh, you know, Regulatory Accountability Act and, and, and talk a little bit more uh, about that. I mean, does anyone on the panel have objections to the Regulatory Accountability Act? Or what, what's the yeah, oh, fake stick? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think it's based on a very serious misunderstanding of the way notice and comment rulemaking works. Just give you a couple of examples. I mean, it, it, it sounds loosey-goosey when you call it informal rulemaking. But let me just tell you the findings of two recent studies, first by a team of researchers at University of Texas, that the average EPA rulemaking, not even the big ones, but the average EPA rulemaking takes over five years and requires tens of thousands of staff hours, okay? That's not very informal, okay? Second, uh, by a finding just came out uh, about three months ago by a team of researchers at uh, University of Wisconsin that the notice and comment process is so resource intensive, so time consuming, that agencies have been able to comply with only 41% of the statutorily mandated rulemakings. They just can't even get all of them out that Congress has told them they must issue. I just read a, a, a judicial opinion the other day berating an agency because it was only 14 years behind in uh, issuing statutorily mandated rules. Congress had said, rightly or wrongly, in the Telecommunications Reform Act of 1996, you must revisit each of these five rules every five years, or every four years, excuse me, and FCC still hadn't been able to do any of them in all of that time. This is not an easy process. And the formal rule they making alternative, well, as I recall uh, in your wonderful study, you found it had only been used, what, four times in the last 10 years. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason why the Supreme Court pretty well knocked it out. Uh, uh, when, when the peanut rulemaking was only halfway through after 10 years, and the peanut rulemaking that had to be done uh, through use of formal rulemaking involved the earth-shattering question of whether peanut butter, to be called such, had to have 87% peanut products or 92% peanut products. The, the formal uh, uh, rulemaking process was less than half completed at the time the FDA said, to hell with it. If we've got to use these procedures, we ain't going to issue any rules at all. So I'm guessing no one has any responses to that. <laughs> no. hey, let's, let's have Susan go first and then Adam here. Um, on peanuts, it seems to me that's where you step back and say, why is it that FDA needs to, tell, needs to do that? I mean, there are labels on peanut butter, um, you know, 
So maybe that is a place we shouldn't be doing rulemaking. Um, the two parts of the Regulatory Accountability Act um, that I do think could be valuable is um, advance notices for the really big regulations. So these are rules that will have billion dollar impacts on the benefits or the cost side. I think that can be valuable because that really, before an agency has their, their plan is set in stone on how to deal with it, there's an opportunity for the public to get involved, different ideas, a discussion of here are several different alternatives. I think that could really improve regulatory outcomes. The other part that I think could be really valuable is the codification of Executive Order 12866, and I think Dick agrees with me on that. And where Dick and I also agree is I'm not so sure about the formal rulemaking process. I think it's, it can be very valuable when you have two a situation where you have two parties with different perspectives and then you allow them to present their evidence before you know a court-like situation. For a lot of these regulations, it's not two parties. It's a lot of different parties, and I think there maybe it's less valuable than it might be in some situations. Dick raises fair points. Um, informal rulemakings take a lot of time to get through. But for me, that's not the, that's not the main problem. It's, the problem is this. It's that, sure, it takes the agencies a long time to promulgate the Clean Power Plan. Uh, that's not the problem. The problem is, to what extent does the EPA actually think about the criticisms and comments it receives? Right? It, it issues notice. It accepts comments. It more or less ignores the comments. I mean, in the Clean Power Plan, they did make some adjustments, but when's the last time a rule of that size actually gave the agency pause along the way in response to comments, right? It's all a kabuki dance. It really is, right? The virtue of the Regulatory Accountability Act is it actually puts people in the room with an opportunity to not just file comments on a website somewhere that bureaucrats will amass and then summarily respond to, but it actually creates a process for people to challenge in a much more direct way the arguments and expertise the agency's bringing to bear. And I think ultimately that, that will advance the cause of good government. Because even if agency personnel go into this, not cynically, but genuinely thinking they're doing the right thing, this entire culture of the administrative state is one of epistemic closure, in which the agencies make up their minds in the first instance and then defend themselves against comments along the way. And I think an in-person hearing and those aspects of formal rulemaking will help fix that. To that end, I also like this idea of retrospective review. Not The usual defense of retrospective review is that it's a good way to repeal rules that are on the books. I don't know. That's, for me, the second best thing about retrospective review. For me, the best part of retrospective review is forcing the agency to go look back at what they did in the past and see what they got right and see what they got wrong. Where were their projections off, right? And just admit it in public. And that, I think, or I hope, will better inform their approach in subsequent rulemakings. It'll open their minds more. And that's what I like about the formal rulemaking process. Not so much that it will take longer, but that it's a more interactive and direct process than the current sort of, again, kabuki dance that informal rulemaking is. I will at least add to that. Uh, one of the, at least one of the ways, one of the reasons that informal rulemaking, notice and comment rulemaking, has gotten as convoluted as it has with notice and comment and having to respond to comments in writing, leading to concise general statements of basis and purpose that are not concise at all, um, et cetera, I think is because we got rid of formal rulemaking where we had everybody in the room together and we created an oral transcript. We needed something to facilitate judicial review. And if you're not going to have an oral transcript and submitted evidence from a formal, a formal oral hearing, then you got to do it on paper. Um, you know, that's one reason I think why informal rulemaking has become as convoluted and as, takes as long as it does you know, in response to getting rid of formal rulemaking, which took too long, arguably, and was very, very complicated. When you're going to promulgate very extensive rules that have significant impact, the process is going to be long and complicated and probably should be long and complicated. The real question is, how do you get the best decisions? Um, and Adam was right in his first comments about the fact that there are trade-offs that have to be made. You're not going to achieve utopian perfection. But are you going to get better rules by putting everyone in a room together and having a conversation? Or are you going to get better rules through a paper process? I think that's, I don't have an answer for that. 
Um, but it's at least worth recognizing that, you know, these things are related to one another in that way. So I, I want to jump in and just, you know, I, I, I'm also a big fan of the Regulatory Accountability Act for, and kind of for three additional reasons that we haven't talked too much about on the panel. Uh, and the first being that it, it forces, it allows for the public and regulated entities to play a bigger role in deciding the inputs for the rule uh, by forcing the agencies. For, and we're talking about for costly rules, right? Not all rules. I'm not sure what the peanut one follows a major rule or I'm not, you know. So we, we are really targeting the, 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 these, 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 these more major and, and, and billion dollar rules. But it allows, before the agency is really diving in to use the data that they want to use, for the regulated entities and the public and the experts to kind of assess uh, that, those inputs. So I think that, that that's a really important uh, part of the process. Uh, and, and the other kind of point there, too, that I think Kristen would like, and I don't know if you had a chance to look through this, is that it, it places a lot of restrictions on the use of interim final rulemaking. Uh, that has gotten way out of control, as Kristen has demonstrated in a recent study of agencies doing a lot of the rulemaking through interim re, uh, rulemaking. Uh, and, and that's a mess. Uh, I, I think it prejudices the agency's view before, you know, the final rule in most cases becomes a formality. Uh, the notice and, you know, the comment process does not allow for meaning, meaningful public input uh, when the agency has already made up its mind and issued an interim final rule. So I'm really glad to see uh, that the Regulatory Accountability Act is trying to tackle that. Now, it doesn't get rid of it. It's still there, but it's sending a message to agencies. You know what? You've, you've just gotten out of control with your use of these. Um, Dick, did you want to have, I'll give you the last word on, on this, because I feel like we all beat up on your, uh, uh, there are lots of critics of the Regulatory Accountability Act. This, this panel is not representative of the world as a whole. Um, I, I do agree on the good, the, the, there's been too much uh, uh, successful use of the good cause exemption from the notice and comment uh, process that, you know, the, uh, uh, Kristen and I actually do a case book as well as a, a treatise and the first edition said this is an exception that's rarely invoked and rarely succeeds and the new edition has several cases and a long discussion of the uh, reports that find that it's being invoked a lot and I, I, I don't like that I, I, I don't quite understand why the courts are being more receptive to that I mean generally I think the courts have been pretty good about uh, enforcing all of the many restrictions on what agencies can and cannot do but that one, for some reason, agencies have been able, successful in circumventing uh, uh, in the last few years. So I, I, I want to open up to questions of the audience, but maybe before we get there, should we, should we spend a little time on the Separation of Powers Restoration Act, or is that, um, and you want to talk more about that, Adam? So, so again, so this is the, the act that I think Senator Hatch in the, in the Senate introduced in the last Congress, uh, getting rid of both our and Chevron deference. Chevron deference being, Courts have to defer to agencies' reasonable interpretations of the statutes they administer, if it's done through some level of formality, like a rule or formal adjudication. And our deference, the evil or deference, as I would label it, that agencies get deference of their interpretations of their own regulations, whether that's done by a, a letter, uh, a memo, or a blog post. Uh, and so those are kind of the two things that Congress is trying to figure out what to, to do with. I know, Adam, you want to kind of get us well, started? I just or? want to redouble one point that I briefly made well, earlier, which is... Opening back to other discussion. Well, I just, I, no, I just, I just want to say that I understand the, the virtues of Separation of Power Restoration Act. Like I said, I'm kind of agnostic on it. But before you formulate a position on it, go back and read the history of what preceded Chevron and why it is that the Supreme Court in cases like Chevron and Vermont Yankee and other cases was pushing back against what the D.C. Circuit was doing, right? Because there's some, you know, what well, the current situation is sometimes the courts are run by Judge David Bazelon and Judge Skelly Wright. And before you formulate a position on Chevron deference, think about which world you want to live in because there's pros and cons to both. And I don't think it's an easy question. What's your take on our, though? And then, okay. well, actually, let's have Kristen jump in. Um, so I just want to follow up what Adam said it, with sort of a, a similar cautionary note in some regards. There's no question when it comes to Chevron deference that there are, we can all point to cases uh, where a court is deferred without a lot of analysis and, you know, you, you become a little skeptical that courts are abdicating their responsibilities. 
On the other hand, you know, when Justice Scalia, who for many years was Chevron's biggest fan, at least theoretically, although he rarely deferred, um, you know, made the observation that, you know, sometimes you can apply all the statutory tools of construction that you can apply, and you still can't come up with an answer. Um, Congress, for better or worse, and as Jonathan Adler pointed out this morning, that's a comment, or that's a debate for another day, Congress has delegated tremendous discretionary policymaking authority to agencies. Sometimes when you're dealing with agency interpretations of statutes, quote unquote, you know, you do get to the point where it's not really interpreting, it's really policy making. Um, you got to ask yourself, do you want the agency making policy or do you want judges making policy in those cases? Chevron gives judges an opportunity to be transparent in saying, we think this case is about policy choice, not about interpretation. If you get rid of deference altogether by trying to get rid of Chevron, um, you know, all you're really ultimately doing in some of those cases is signaling to courts, you know, it, it, telling courts, well, you know, I don't think courts are going to stop deferring because I don't think judges want to be making policy. I don't think they're comfortable with making policy. Um, I think what instead judges are going to do in those instances is, you know, they'll still defer. They'll just come up with some other fig leaf of legal reasoning to justify that outcome. You know, Chevron's more transparent in that way. Um, you know, sure, trying to get rid of Chevron or saying we ought to curtail deference might signal to courts, hey, we, we're concerned you're not doing your job, you need to step up a little bit more. But you're still going to have those cases that are policy oriented. And that's what was driving the Chevron court in the first place. Adam's absolutely right about the alternative um, being judicial policy making or. Uh, hiding behind other legal reasoning. I, I think we're all pretty much on the same page on this. I mean, I, I consider the Separation of Powers Act to be much ado about absolutely nothing. Uh, the, the, I want to separate particular legal doctrines from deference. There's always going to be deference. You're never going to stop deference. And it's always going to vary to some extent on how complicated uh, the issue is and, and whether it involves exercise of a whole lot of expertise. Because, you know, judges say, well, let's see. This came to me. It's been uh, the subject of 6,000 hours of, of study by a whole bunch of people, many of them with PhDs in fields I can't spell the names of. Uh, I, I'm supposed to ignore this? That's silly, of course. I'm always going to be deferential. I'm always going to take my responsibilities seriously. But I'm always going to be respectful of, and, and you're always going to get something like what we've had for a long time, about two-thirds of the opinion, the actions are withheld, upheld and a third aren't. And then when it comes to these specific doctrines, I, I just would remind everybody, the, there's only one justice who was strongly supportive of Chevron for his entire time on the court, Justice Scalia who was the least deferential of the justices throughout that entire 30-year period. And there was one justice who absolutely despised Chevron and made that clear every way he possibly could. That's Justice Breyer, who's the most deferential of the... So, you know, it's just playing word games that are meaningless. Oh, man, you're just trying to provoke <laughs> me, aren't you? Uh... <laughs> So I, a uh, co-author and I just spent three years reviewing about 2,000 Chevron decisions in the circuit courts. Uh, and my view is very different than Dick's. Maybe it's not. I just don't think the proper focus is the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court gets very few cases dealing with Chevron deference a year. They do whatever they want to do, and I think that's right. Uh, that, not right that it's the right thing to do, but that it's descriptively true. Uh, but the circuit courts, Chevron plays a really strong anchoring role uh, of agency deference in a way that I think that, that, that is meaningful and that chipping away at it, whether it's with the major questions doctrine that we got in King v. Burwell or, or if it's with a Justice Gorsuch, uh, Justice Thomas combo doing something fun and crazy, uh, it really could uh, make agencies be a little bit more conservative or less aggressive, more faithful in following their statutory mandates. But we're not talking about our. That's the thing from reviewing these 2,000 cases. Our is awful. Uh, 
Uh, I mean, the, the win rate under our, which we didn't do in our study, but we review a lot, and, and, and uh, um, Willie Yatman has a great study on this. It's like 90%. Chevron's about 74%. Our is 90%. Having read a lot of these cases, what are our difference cases? The agency sends a letter to the court saying this is what we think the interpretation is. The agency, some random official of the agency, sends a letter to a regulated entity saying this is what uh, our interpre or regula interpretation of our, our regulation is. And we're giving more deference to that uh, where there's absolutely no formality. Uh, lots of times the head of the agency is not even going to have ever even thought about this you know, random question. It just seems wrong to me. Uh, I don't know if anyone has reactions on the hour point. Um, well, I, I, I did do an empirical study of four years of uh, district court and circuit court applications of our. And you don't my, hate it? Pardon? You don't hate it after doing that? No. <laughs> I, 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 first of all, the, the, the finding was 76% upholding, not anything like 90%. Oh, okay. And then the court issued its opinion in 2012 in Christopher versus Smith Klein, in which it emphasized a whole bunch of the limits on uh, the, our deference. And since then, I've only had a few years experience, but, but it, the, the upholding rate has gone down to about 71%, which is roughly what you get with, with uh, the other doctrines. Uh, so, you know, and, uh, are there cases where it's, it confers too much deference? Uh, un undoubtedly, but uh, uh, overall, I, I think, again, it's much ado about nothing. I think the critique of our deference, uh, John Manning and, and then the justices that followed, I think, is well taken. I have one thing, I, a question I raise in the hour debates. I don't have an answer to it, but I, I hope you'll think about it, too. Let's say we get rid of our deference. So now the courts are doing de novo, judicial review of agency interpretations of their own rules. But Chevron is still in place, so they're being deferential to the agencies. Um, what, does it, what, does that, what does it feel like to be a judge in that world, where you're thinking really hard and nitpicking agency interpretations of agency regulations, but you're being very deferential on the big questions, the statutory questions. How do judges react to that? How does that change their mindset? How does that change the way they go about Chevron? I don't know. But I think once, once our deference goes away, I think that's going to be the beginning of pulling on a thread that's going to have much bigger ramifications on the back end. I think that's one of the reasons why Scalia was allegedly backing away from Chevron deference near the end of his life. Um, I think that there's a lot of possible explanations for that, assuming it, ha it was true. But I think that Scalia's rethinking of our deference may have ultimately proven, I mean, if he would have lived longer, I only wish, um, it could have had much greater ramifications, and I think it will if we get rid of our. So let's open up to some questions from the audience. Good prediction. We have lots of questions, so that's good. Bring them on, yeah. No, I mean, so me, my biggest concern is the formality point. Uh, uh, I think that, that that's what's most troubling. Uh, and if Skidmore is the replacement, I'm fine with that. But so, a question for Jonathan. Yeah, uh, Jonathan Adler. Um, I was curious what the panelists' thoughts were on the remedy side. There's a, a common practice in the DC Circuit uh, to remand agency rules without vacator uh, when agencies have committed one APA violation or another. Um, and uh, I'm wondering whether or not that's something that Congress should uh, be paying attention to, either by providing greater guidance for courts on when remand without vacator is, is important, uh, or whether we should stick with the status quo. And just one footnote, it seems to me at least that whether remand without vacator is a good or bad idea, it is at odds with the plain text of the APA, which seems to suggest that if it's, if it's uh, not followed, that vacator is the only appropriate remedy. So I'd be curious about thoughts about that. Um, I'm a big fan of the legal regime now in place, which, as you know, is not always vacate or never vacate, but it depends. And, and it's a two-part test. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you, you don't vacate when you remand if one, you think vacation would be extremely disruptive in, in some respect, and two, you believe that whatever 
error or whatever flaw, gap, or whatever in, in, ag in agency reasoning uh, you detected as the basis for your decision to remand is something that the agency is likely to be able to correct on remand. I think that's an excellent pragmatic way of dealing with this intensely practical problem of whether whether on remand, whether you vacate at the same time you remand or not. The, the, the remedial issue that really troubles me these days is I, I see a much greater emphasis on stays. Uh, and I understand where that's coming from. It's coming from the sequence of actions that took place in the Mercury place in the case and, and uh, the uh, judges being quite angry when the EPA spokesperson came on and said, yeah, we lost in the Supreme Court, so what? We already won uh, on the ground. Uh, and, and that's produced a, a, a much greater willingness to issue stays. And I find that troubling, but I don't have an, a, a better alternative given circumstances like uh, the Mercury Rule. The Review Act provides you, uh, you know, the Basically, the rule doesn't go into effect until judicial review is done for billion-dollar rules. So Adam, uh, Susan, do you want to jump in first? Okay. Um, I don't mean to keep dominating the time, but I, I, I totally agree with Jonathan's reading of the statute. I think vacator or remand without vacator is just illegal. It's against the statute. I also think it's bad policy. I mean, I understand that I understand the point that sometimes it, it'd be too troublesome to vacate the whole rule, right, and just remand it to fix little things that the agency got wrong. But what incentives does that create, right? It means that the agency can shove as much into a rule as they want, knowing that if they get little details wrong, the whole rule might stay into place, right? If vacator, just vacator, was the remedy, then agencies are going to think long and hard about these little marginal errors because they know they're putting their entire rulemaking at risk. I don't know. I kind of like that. On stays, it's the same thing. The agencies have such practical power from the status quo once they get a rule into place. You know, I, I know the, the, the new Regulatory Accountability Act wants to get rid of all stays for the most costly of rules. Here's a, here's a more moderated suggestion. What about just flipping the presumption? What about for the costliest of rules, you put, instead of having the burden be on the challengers to prove it's an exceptional case that warrants a stay pending review, put the burden on the agency to show that it's, a, that it's an exceptional case and therefore there shouldn't be a stay pending review. That way, in cases of emergencies or the most pressing of circumstances, the agency could still begin to enforce its rule pending appeal, but put it on the agency to make the exceptional case and allow the default presumption to be that the costliest of rules don't go into effect until judicial review is over. All right. More I want to hang on. I want to add one thing real quick, which is that I think when it comes to the remand, uh, the, the vacator remedy, Part of it depends on exactly what the flaw is. We do have a harmless error rule that's contained in the APA as originally written. It's in Section 706. Historically, the <clears throat> remand without vacator was applied when you just didn't explain one aspect of a rule enough, you know, basically state farm analysis. Um, and I agree with Adam's assessment, generally speaking, although, you know, you can get to a point where you're nitpicking agency rules so much under state farm that there's no way, it, 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 in some sense, it does too much in terms of, you know, in, it doesn't incentivize anything, it's just discouraging. Even when agencies are trying their best to do go in good faith. But the interim final rules issue that Chris mentioned earlier, you have seen some cases historically in which the remand without vacator remedy was applied when you had an agency that just didn't follow procedural requirements. They inverted the procedures by doing, using uh, interim final rulemaking without a valid claim of good cause, and the court would apply the remand without vacator remedy in that context. And other courts have said, well, wait a minute, violating procedural requirements like that is more categorical. It's a bigger problem than just failing to explain one aspect of a rule under State Farm. So I think at least, you know, Dick's right up to a point about the current standard. I think thinking a little bit more about what constitutes harmless error and Adam's point about shifting the burden of, you know, persuasion in terms of the lack of prejudice uh, versus the prejudicial effect of the particular violation is relevant. All right. Next question. Uh, John Siegel, GW Law School. 
This question goes back to the Regulatory Accountability Act. I don't want to be one of these professors, Adam mentioned, who said that th thinks that the APA is sacrosanct. But I would say, whatever you think about the r current rulemaking procedures, at least we know what they are. At least we have a pretty good idea of what agencies need to do to make a rule. But it took decades to get there. Courts were still discovering requirements in the simple language of 553, which is one page long. Courts were still discovering requirements in that language in the 1970s and 80s. So my concern uh, about the Regulatory Accountability Act is if you strike 553 and replace it with you know 10 or 20 pages of requirements, even if those requirements uh, duplicate things like executive orders that are in part of current law, once they're in statutory text, aren't we going to experience decades, 30, 40, 50 years of uncertainty as courts figure out uh, you know, each of these new requirements will be litigated and it'll take decades before we have definitive understandings of just what agencies are supposed to do to make rules. So how would you respond to that concern? So lots of tenure articles, right? <laughs> <Adam? Yeah. laughs> oh, um, crowd just falls asleep thinking about that. Um, no, I, listen, I'm not, I'm usually the conservative one saying let's go slow on this. Let's, maybe we shouldn't just begin the world anew. So it's a fair point that the new APA would be much longer, much more detailed, much more, these new questions that would need to be asked. I think the virtue is that Congress is finally getting into this discussion. You're right, the APA was fleshed out, right? It, the, the statute itself is a few pages long, and then we spend a whole semester teaching it. Incidentally, I teach it out of Professor Pierce and Professor Hickman's casebook. Uh, but I think it's good that Congress is getting involved, and to the extent that reforms give rise to problematic interpretations, or we learn that Congress erred too far in one direction or the other, and the courts are highlighting it, at least Congress will be back in the process. They can return to it. I like, I like that Congress is actually writing legislation on this instead of the courts having some conversation all around Congress about legal fictions about delegation and what was intended and what was a major question. And we don't want to add new processes on top of what Congress wrote, but we need to flesh out the meaning that was in this thin statute that was written in 46. I'm glad that Congress is just finally getting all of this on the table. And let's have a conversation from that point. I want to add to that that I think the problem with just sticking with the Administrative Procedure Act as it currently stands is there's so much literature out there about how the contem contemporary administrative practices, there's a whole realm of contemporary administrative practices that don't fit within the APA's terms. There, you know, with some of the things I was talking about like coordinated litigation settlement agreements or uh, compliance waivers and you know all these different there are lots and lots of practices that agencies engage in now that just don't fit neatly in the four corners of the APA and so uh, you know I think it's worth taking some time to think about how we make the APA work um, you know in given contemporary administrative practices it's a creaky statute it's been around a long time it was adopted it based on a survey of best practices predating 1946. The world's just different now. We do things differently. And so failing to update the act, I think in some sense, just leaves an awful lot of stuff outside of the APA's protections, which have served us well historically. Hello. Oh, well, great, yeah. yeah. Frank Mannheim, <clears throat> George Mason University. I have a macro question. I don't think this panel would be even meeting if the U.S. were not uh, unique among uh, uh, advanced nations in terms of its 45-year-old labyrinthine regulatory system, especially the environmental regulatory system, which kicked off the whole system. And I'm uh, I'm aware that there are now voices, even among conservatives, I mean conservationists and environmentalists, that the system is inefficient, is not working, is not capable of meeting the requirements of global climate change. So I want to ask if any of you panelists are aware of, in your institutions or elsewhere, of movements more, for more fundamental reform of our uh, basic regulatory laws, and especially the environmental laws. 
Well, we got the we didn't get Jonathan Adler on this panel. He could go for hours about this. But does anyone else want to jump in or I'll jump in just with one observation, and this is not specific to any particular area of regulation like environment or tax or financial or whatever. But one of the reasons why our system is the way that it is is because of our separate system of separated powers. Um, it, my understanding from my friends in the UK and Australia and other places that have parliamentary systems of government where the executive and the legislative branches are much more connected to one another, they don't have the regulatory structure we have because whenever they have a problem that needs to be fixed that's figured out through sort of the, their agency structures, then they just do a legislative fix because the executive and the legislature are so connected to one another. We don't have that option. So it seems to me that, you know, the kind of macro change you're talking about would require a constitutional convention. And I don't, I think we're mostly pretty wedded to our system of separated powers. So I don't see that happening. If you want, oh, Susan, jump in here. Um, you know, I think you're right. And I think this gets back to Jonathan's point on the first panel that um, statutes statutes are passed and then we just live with them for, for decades, like the Clean Air Act and the environmental area. Um, I think one thing that we might be seeing is because there's been an emphasis um, in the in Speaker Ryan's Better Way plan about more federalism, um, that may be a way that we see. And of course, it doesn't address your climate change. It's the opposite of that. But for a lot of environmental issues, um, there, there may be a move afoot to defer more things to state level <coughs> regulation as opposed to federal, which I, I think there are a lot of important areas in which we could and should rely much less on command and control regulation and much more on market mechanisms. And the obvious first step is get rid of all the garbage we're trying to do on climate change, most of which is outrageously expensive and totally ineffective, and replace it with a single properly priced carbon tax. Every, the, that's far more effective, far lower cost. I understand the T word is not a word that can be uttered in this I building, I, I, but I, I, I uh, like solve climate change uh, panel. Let's get another question in here. <laughs> Yeah, oh, oh, microphone behind him. Oh, is there someone else first? Oh, great, in the back. Uh, Chuck Gordon, a retired uh, agency regulatory attorney. The agencies have made the air cleaner, the uh, water cleaner, cars are less polluting, more economical, safer, and faster. Uh, workers are protected from asbestos. Uh, virtually all regulations that come out have benefits much greater than costs. So why do so many people in this room hate those agencies and want to hamstring them? <laughs> Is that rhetorical or <laughs> Adam I can jump? There was an interesting memoir that was written a couple of years ago by a woman named Margot Oge. She headed the I think the Air Office, the Auto Office, the EPA, and it was an account of the EPA's work on auto regulation. And she called the book Driving the Future. And I thought the title said a lot, maybe more than she intended it to say. I think she was taking credit for so much of what American society and the American people and American capitalism have produced. And it's true that agencies have played an important, a very important role in making the air cleaner and the water cleaner. And I think that conservatives sometimes err in belittling that, that contribution. But what else made the water cleaner and the air cleaner is the immense prosperity that the American people and American capitalism produced. And what we don't see when there's overregulation is the wealth that isn't created, the jobs that aren't created, the technology that's never created. All of those things are the cost of regulation. They're an invisible cost. It's easy to show the costs of non-regulation. It's Lake Erie catching, or the Cuyahoga, as John Adler has written about this, the Cuyahoga allegedly catching on fire. Um, it, it's, the, it's the truly unfortunate deaths that happen because there isn't enough consumer safety protection on a product, and those are real costs. But overregulation has costs too, and they're invisible costs. And when we've allowed the economy to flourish, we've done so much to protect the environment. There's a reason why the environment is cleanest in the societies that are the wealthiest. Um, I hope this is on. Uh, my name is Elaine Middleman. I'm an attorney in private practice. This may be a little off 
the main point here, but I've experienced in the D.C. Circuit that like a week before oral argument, the agency will submit a letter to the court saying something like, well, we're not going to do that anymore, or we've changed our policy, or sorry about that. And the courts just rely on that, and that's the end of it. So, I mean, they're just accepting, you know, at whole cloth whatever the agency said. And, I, you know, that seems like complete deference to me. I guess yeah. the only point I would say is I'm not sure what else the courts could do in the sense of if it, agency attorneys come in front of you and say, we reverse that policy or we're not doing, you know, this is our current practice or something like that. I'm not sure the courts are in a position not to take those attorneys at their word. We saw in the immigration case in Texas when Department of Justice attorneys um, told things to the court that the court relied upon that then were not true. Well, then you go through sort of the, the, the disciplinary mechanisms. Um, and there's some debate about whether the court had the power to order those attorney, the Department of Justice to re-educate its attorneys and things like that. But I'm not sure. I mean, you got to take, if you're a court, I assume you have to take representations of attorneys before you to some degree at face value. You can inquire, I guess. But what else do you do? I'm just, and, and this is actually just sort of a question because I'm not sure what else a court could do. So I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Having, you know, I'm, I can't resist not, you know, having worked on civil appellate staff at the Justice Department and maybe having sent some of those letters out, they don't just get sent out, right? <laughs> There's a lot of consultation, uh, uh, usually all the way up to the Solicitor General's office and at the agency level, and as an attorney signing that letter, you know you're putting yourself in the crosshairs of a contempt uh, order from the court if it doesn't turn out to be true. In fact, there's a great new article by Nick Perillo uh, that's coming out in the Harvard Law Review, where he documents the history of courts uh, using contempt orders against agency officials and folks at the Justice Department when they don't do what the court says uh, that they have to do. And I think that kind of falls in that same ambit. But I can't think of a lot of great examples where what they said ended up being not true and they didn't somehow get in trouble for it. I think there's enough incentives there that I'm not, I'm losing the sleep about other stuff with the administrative state, not so much about Justice Department attorneys. Uh, representations to courts, but, but maybe I should be more. Oh, we got time for one last question. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. In the back. Yep, yep. Oh, yeah, okay. Great. Thank you. Great panel. Um, so this is uh, a question on the RAA, and going off of Professor Pierce's concerns on uh, ossification, I know the uh, ABA Administrative Law section has also shared some of those concerns in a comment they, they published in the Administrative Law Review. Um, do you think that passing the RAA at this point will uh, be a problem for uh, an agenda that seeks to repeal quite a few rules from the, the last eight years in terms of putting in place you know, procedures that will lead to ossification, that will slow down those rule repeals. Take the EPA Clean Power Plan as an example. Formal rulemaking may make it uh, harder for the EPA to, uh, to do the, uh, the repeal of the Clean Power Plan, make them take longer, maybe make it more legally vulnerable um, or do you think it's, uh, uh, so do you, do, you, do you agree with that? And then if you do, do you believe that um, it would be a good idea then to basically discard the APA's neutrality with respect to rulemaking versus rule repeals and have the RAA's procedures only apply to rulemaking uh, versus rule repeals? Anyone want to jump in? <laughs> Susan, yeah. <laughs> well, this was related to my question for the first panel on the RAINS Act, um, that it, it should be that it would, whatever, whether the regulation is being repealed or not. And I think both of the panelists, both, both of our Jonathans said, yeah, it should apply equally to both. It should be about the process, not the particular goal of that particular regulation. But. I've actually been thinking quite a bit about how the many people who have been uh, um, saying, well, the notice and comment process is too easy. We need to make it more rigorous. Uh, 
uh, how they're going to feel as they see how difficult and time consuming and resource intensive it, it is over the next four years as the Trump administration finds that it has to use notice and comment rulemaking and the Supreme Court held in 1983 that the standards is the same, the procedures are the same. It has to use that process to, to rescind or amend any rule. I think a whole lot of people who are now saying notice and comment rulemaking is too easy to get are going to be saying this is way too damn hard. It's been ossified. We can't get rid of the rules that takes years and years and by the time it's done, President Trump has been replaced by God knows whom. <laughs> I'll let Adam have the last word and then we'll wrap up. I would just say really briefly, I mean, to the extent that this is a real concern, and I think it probably is, why not build in a, a, a transition period into the act, right? A period in, say, five, five to seven to ten years to say, for some rule, for, for in this period, the, the process used to repeal rule is uh, at least as rigorous as the process that was used to formulate the rule in the first place, right? That's a fix. But here's another thing, though, is in the long run, somebody like me who's, who's on the, the conservative side and who would like to see these rules repealed, I understand that in the long run, if my side doesn't win the political process, the larger political process, all of these debates over individual rules falls away. The rules will come back. There will be other rules. And so if my side can't muster the political power and the political success to engage in a sustained critique of these rules through the process required under the new statutes, then we're probably doomed anyway. Um, how's that for a bright note to end on? Oh, that's really depressing. I, I think that uh, Senator Lee in, at, in 10 minutes might give us a brighter picture of how Congress can help undo some of the, you know, by legislation, uh, clean up some of this mess. But thanks so much to the panelists for coming. This has been a lot of fun, and we'll be around for comments and questions afterwards.